Today's talk is by Joe Lachance. Uh, Joe, I just saw you in your office squeezing your little... Um, Genetic stress ball, yeah. <laughs> your little stress ball. <laughs> so uh, I'm hopeful this isn't very stressful. Nah, it's fine. Uh, for, for those of you on the call, uh, because of the unique platform of these virtual seminars, uh, we will ask you to please mute your microphones and your cameras during Joe's talk, and then you can come back on face-to-face uh, -face for questions and answers when uh, the seminar is concluded. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Gibson, who will introduce uh, our speaker on behalf of the School Tenure and Promotion Committee. Greg. Thank you very much, Todd. Um, well, it's great to be here to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Joe Lachance. Um, I'm actually probably more stressed than he is. It's uh, seeing, seeing one of your mentees uh, progress to this phase is, is a delight. Joe um, gained his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago and then moved to Stony Brook uh, to cut his teeth, as so many geneticists of, of our era did, on, on Drosophila. And he became a prominent population geneticist uh, at Stony Brook for his PhD. And then he moved to uh, Penn to work with Sarah Tishkoff and was one of the first people to show us the way as to how to infer adaptation from whole genome sequencing. And it's there that he started doing his groundbreaking work uh, looking at the genetics of health disparities and, and the genetics of complex traits in African uh, ancestry individuals, particularly individuals uh, from, from Africa. Um, that work actually was, was a large part, I think, of the reason why Sarah, uh, or contributed certainly to her gaining membership of the National Academy of Sciences last year. Um, and was a big part of the reason why we hired him, obviously. Since arriving uh, at Georgia Tech, he's established a, a, a small and productive group, has done wonderful work uh, with his graduate students. Um, he's received a CTL uh, Junior Faculty Teaching Excellence Award, and I have the honor of teaching with him in the Summer Institute of Statistical Genetics, where he's absolutely fabulous. Um, uh, Joe has uh, been appointed as a, a executive member of the American Association for Anthropology and uh, is just a very valued member of our community and I look forward to uh, hearing his talk today as I'm sure the rest of you do. Uh, take it away, Joe. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Greg. All right, I'm going to hit the mute all button and begin sharing my screen. All right. So yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about what my lab's been up to the last five years, and it's going to be a pretty broad um, set of set of studies, but it's going to give, hopefully it'll be, you know, united in a, in a common theme. So today I'm going to talk about evolution and prediction of genetic disease risks in ancient and modern humans. And you can think about this as a pretty broad topic, but it's motivated by one central question. And that question is, why do genetic disease risks vary across populations, right? And so it's really getting at that fundamental question and then trying to figure out, like, well, what what happens when we look beyond just a single single place in the world? And this this question is the driving force behind my NIGMS Mir Award. And so um, basically, we're, we're we're tasked with looking both at how disease risks have evolved over time, and then also looking at how disease risks vary across space. So to give you a little bit of an outline of what today's talk is going to cover, divide it into four broad themes. The first of which deals with anthropog anthropological genetics and human evolutionary history. The second part deals with ancient precision medicine and a lot more of the evolutionary angle. Evolutionary angle. The third part looks at a, a major health disparity and that involves prostate cancer in men of African descent. And then the fourth part deals with something that we're, we're grappling with right now, which is the, the, the real challenges we have when we're trying to extrapolate results from one place in the world to other places. So when you think about it, if you go to your family doctor, you know, it's just this idea that you know, medicine benefits from a knowledge of family history. Well, we can, we can take things, you know, step back a little bit. It turns out that public health genomics also benefits from, you know, some sense of family history. But in this case, it's the history of a population. And so the idea is if we want to understand health and disease in our species, we really need to know where we came from. The good thing is that in the last, you know, 15 years or so, we've really had this big, big boom in terms of how much we know about the genetics of our species. So if we look in terms of Mendelian disease, we can look in OMIM, there's over 4,000 genes that have, a known, that have known phenotype causing mutations. We can also think about all these, you know, genome-wide association studies that have been done in the last 15 years or so. And, you know, to date, this is maybe a week old, but, you know, there's over 4,600 publications 
There's 197,000 trait associations. So what we've got is we've got all these genetic variants. We know they're associated with traits, many of which are disease-related traits. And Andy's like, well, what can we do with this information? You know, how can we better understand you know, human health? And one way to do that is to use something called the polygenic risk score. So if you see the initials PRS, that's what it refers to. Sometimes people call it a genetic risk score. And really what this is, is sort of a fancy way of saying we're mapping genotype to phenotype. Okay, so it's an old idea in genetics. And so um, the simple way that you generate a polygenic risk score is you just are counting the number of disease increasing alleles in somebody's genome and you weight that by effect size. You can imagine that if you happen to have more so-called bad alleles than somebody else, maybe you're at higher risk for a disease. And this, the, the plot here is actually showing um, uh, polygenic restore for coronary artery disease. It's from a study from Nature Genetics by Kara et al. And what, what it's showing is what's the prevalence of coronary artery disease as a function of what somebody's polygenic risk score. So there's 100 dots here. You think about all, each one of these percentiles. And what this is showing is that those people that happen to have a high PRS for CAD, if you're in the 99th or 98th percentile, you have a much, much higher risk. So it actually is doing something, right? But one challenge with this is that the frequencies of these risk, risk increasing reels differ across populations, right? And so the idea is that those allele frequency differences can actually lead to differences in disease risk when you look across, across the globe. And since I, you know, my training was originally as an evolutionary geneticist, what, it's not just the idea of saying, well, what's the pattern? But what you want to think about is, well, what can cause those differences in risk allele frequencies? And there's lots of causes, but I tend to like to think about these three ones as major ones. So we can think about what are these evolutionary mechanisms of allele frequency change? So first of all, we can think about population bottlenecks and founder effects. This is genetic drift working in some sense in an accelerated way. Another way that you can get allele frequency changes across the world is to think about gene flow. And to me, the most interesting sort of gene flow involves ancient integration. And thirdly, we can think about, well, how does natural selection lead to allele frequency change? I mean, this is a way to get allele frequency differences across populations in a really, really fast period of time. So, and hopefully some, you know, most of you are familiar with population genetics. But when we think about genetic drift, we can think about allele frequencies that are varying across populations over time. Um, the little animation here is a MATLAB simulation where I looked at 10,000 independent loci. We've got the allele frequency in Europe on the y-axis, allele frequency in Africa on the x, and each one of these is a separate locus. And you can just see that as time progresses, these allele frequencies start to differ in these populations. Okay, And so that's one way that you can get these differences in disease allele frequencies. But you can also have this accelerated. So sometimes what you can have is something called a population bottleneck, or if it's a founding a new population, you can call it a founder effect. And the idea here is that whenever you have a small population, whenever you have a population bottleneck, you have this basically, you're, what you're doing is you're subsetting that original variation. So imagine our initial population happens to have a gold allele and a white allele. Well, with this bottleneck, it turns out that you have a smaller population that results from it. And just by chance, the gold allele happened to increase in, fre increase in frequency. And the idea here is that this is a mechanism where we can get big differences in risk allele frequencies between populations. So what do we know about human history? Well, one thing we know is that Africa is the ancestral homeland of our species. And a few years ago, I was on, this, uh, on a major paper that looked at this great, great migration out of Africa to the rest of the world. And there were many things in the study, but one thing that, you know, it sort of, you know, affirms previous studies, but we can look at how genetic diversity scales with where you are in the world. And the farther you, farther you get from Africa, the less genetic diversity you happen to see in an individual genome. What's also interesting about this is that when we looked at different parts of the genome, or different parts of the world, we actually found evidence of multiple waves of migration out of Africa. And one way to think about it is the sort of alleles that you see in Australia or Papua New Guinea might be a little bit different than what you see in India or China or, or in, in the New World. Okay. So the idea is that we've got this, this pattern where as humans spread to explore the world, we have these serial founder effects and bottlenecks. And the idea is that we're subsampling human diversity as we go along. And the question is, does this have anything to do with disease risks? And it turns out it actually does. So I've got, I'm showing a, a panel in the bottom. This is from a paper from Brennahan. And what she found was that there's a slight increase in the number of deleterious alleles that you find when you look farther and farther from Africa. It's not a major increase, but it's notable. And the, the idea behind this is that when you get farther and farther away from Africa, you have populations that have smaller effective 
sizes. And when you have a small effective population size, what that means is that the efficacy of natural selection is not as strong. So you might have some stuff that's slightly deleterious and it just can't be flushed out by natural selection. And so one byproduct of this is that African genomes contain slightly fewer deleterious alleles. And so this, this process of humans exploring the, the world that shaped you know, the amount of you know, genetic load that, that we have. But as humans explored the world, it actually hasn't been as simple as you might think. So one thing you can think about is, you know, as, as humans spread and explore different places, you know, has the number of men equal the number of women? And one neat thing that we can do, and one thing that my lab's done, is we've done comparisons between X chromosomes and autosomes. And the idea here is that every time a man moves, he brings a you know, diploid set of autosomes, but he only brings one X chromosome. Every time a woman moves, she brings a full diploid, you know, complement of autosomes, but she also brings two X chromosomes. And so by comparing these two sets of genetic data, what that allows us to do is to have some idea whether men or women are moving. And so the panel on the top here is showing X chromosome diversity on the top half of each circle, autosomal diversity on the bottom, and it's, it's standardized so that deep blue is basically reflecting the, the maximum amount of diversity we see in our species. So it's showing African genetic diversity. And you can see it's humans left Africa. We've got a decrease in both X and autosome diversity, but this decrease is much stronger for X diversity, okay? And that's suggesting that not as many X chromosomes from Africa got out to Japan and China and other places in the world. And what this is consistent with is this idea that the out of African migration ended up being male bias. Okay, so we've done a number of computer simulations, we've used mathematical models, and a sort of a safe, you know, interval would be somewhere between 62 to 71 percent of individuals coming out of Africa in that initial wave seem to be male. That's, that's dealing with deep time, though. We're talking about, say, 75,000 years ago. We could use FST statistic and other population genetic statistics to look at more recent migration. And when we do that, we actually see a different pattern. We see that sometimes we have men moving between populations more than women, sometimes the opposite. Sometimes it's women that are moving more. And one interesting thing that comes out of this is that we find that whether men or women move between communities, it seems to be largely independent of subsistence patterns. So whether somebody's a hunter-gatherer, a farmer, or a herder, it, it basically, you can't necessarily say that, okay, just because somebody's a family farm, the, you know, the firstborn son is going to stay there and then women move between populations. It's not necessarily as simple as that. We can also look at other aspects of sex bias migration. So I also was on this on a paper that looked at Y chromosomal DNA versus mitochondrial DNA. Once again, Y chromosomes are inherited paternally or you know, basically inherited from fathers to sons, mitochondrial from mothers to daughters and so on. And what we can do is we can look at the effective population sizes inferred from Y chromosomes and in mitochondrial DNA. What that does is it lets us know whether there were large numbers of men or women living at different periods of time. And the y-axis here are actually scale different. So actually, there's actually more women contributing to human gene pools than men, um, which fits a little bit with ideas of reproductive skew. But the striking thing that happens here is if you look about 8,000, 7,000 years in the past, you see this big drop in the effective number of males that are contributing to human gene pools. And what's really interesting about this is that that tends to correspond with the onset of agriculture. Okay, and it happens all over the world, but we see there's a little bit of time lag in, in continents where, where agriculture was discovered a little bit later than other places. And it's consistent with this idea that, okay, when there was the discovery of ag agriculture, there might have been farming males that might have happened to have spouses that were hunter-gatherer females. Okay, so the idea is that by comparing different parts of the genome, we can get a, a better handle on what's going on in terms of human history. The other thing you could do with genetic data is you can infer when populations diverged, how much migration there is, um, ancestral population sizes, all sorts of um, details like that. But the truth is that human demographic history is very complex. So um, one study I was involved in, we ended up looking at um, African hunter-gatherers and we wanted to infer you know, ancestral population sizes. And so one thing you, know, you can see is like the Hadza and the Sandawi hunter-gatherers, they separated 21,000 years ago and the Hadza seemed to have had a smaller effective population size. But one thing when we ran these um, isolation with migration models was that we found that if you don't include unsampled so-called ghost populations, your estimates are going to be off. So these are sort of the known unknowns. So like even if we care about the Baca, the Yoruba, the Hadza and Sadawe, that's not all of Africa, right? So we need to worry about the fact that there are other populations out there. And if you don't include those, you're going to get very, very skewed estimates. So one question is, what could ghost populations be, whether that's in Africa or the rest of the world? And when we look outside of Africa, you know, an easiest, you know, easy call on that would be, oh, maybe it's Neanderthals. 
And so in, in 2010, so 10 years ago, there were a couple of papers that, that really changed the field of evolutionary genomics. And you know, from David Reich and Svante Pablo's lab. And the first one was this, it led to the, it introduced this idea that, wow, non-African genomes contain Neanderthal DNA. One to 2% of their genomes happen to come from this archaic integration. I mean, if they looked as you know, good looking as this guy, maybe that's not a surprise. The other thing that was actually really surprising is that in Papua New Guineans, there was another ghost population, this idea of these Den Denisovans. So they had DNA that was coming from a lineage that sort of is the evolutionary cousin of Neanderthals. So this picture starting to get more and more complex. And so these, these two papers dealt with you know, fossilized data, but you can also use fossil-free methods. And what you're really doing is looking for haplotypes or stretches of DNA that really differ between parents. And so Shortly before coming to Georgia Tech, I was involved in a study where we identified evidence of ancient introgression in Africa. This wasn't Neanderthal, this was some unknown mystery lineage, okay? After joining Georgia Tech, we pursued this in a little bit more deeper, um, on a deeper level, and what we see found evidence of ancient integration that occurred multiple times in Africa. And the, the idea here is that you sometimes have this DNA that, that looks very different from normal human DNA. Sometimes it tends to be in small chunks or very, very large chunks, and the chunk size actually has to do with how long ago there was this integration. And so what we've really got is this idea of human history involves all these sort of splits of populations and then the secondary contact. Okay, it's not a simple picture, but what ends up happening is that whenever you've got secondary contact, you're getting alleles from these different lineages, and those alleles actually can have health consequences. So what might they have? Well, there's a really cool study from Karine Samate when she was in, at Vanderbilt, and what she did was she looked at electronic health records, and she just looked at a huge number of samples, of human samples, and was able to see, okay, let's identify the individuals with, the, with a lot of Neanderthal DNA, and let's see what sort of medical traits they tend to be enriched for. And what she found is that neurological disorders tend to be a little bit more common in individuals that have a lot of Neanderthal DNA. So for whatever reason, those alleles that maybe happen to be negatively affecting neurologic traits, they happen to come from this other lineage. The reason why this matters when we look across the globe is that the amount of Neanderthal DNA really, really varies wherever you look across the, the world. So if your ancestors tend to be from Nigeria, you might have very, very small amounts of Neanderthal DNA, but if you happen to be from Beijing, you're going to see a lot more. And so that can actually affect your disease risk. We can also think about other mechanisms of allele frequency change. So the big one you can think about is natural selection. And here I'm thinking about local adaptation. This is from a review paper from Xiao Wafan. And one thing when you think about human adaptation, there's lots of traits that tend to be selected. But one thing that keeps coming out a lot is that diet matters a lot and you know you can think about you know pathogen pressure and immune function like that's that's there's a lot of selection pressure involving those sort of traits and what this could do is it could lead to really really big allele frequency differences between populations but it's important to realize that whenever you have selection or adaptation it doesn't just affect a single allele it affects the surrounding dna and so we've got this process that we, we call genetic hitchhiking. And what it means is that you can have this sort of secondary effect going on. So this little cartoon example is looking at, you know, number of chromosomes. Um, we're looking at eight little haplotypes here. And the black allele is beneficial. So it's good for some sort of trait. And it's linked to gold allele, blue allele, and some white alleles. But what's up happening is when you get local adaptation, that black allele increases in frequency, and it drags along these other alleles. And it just so happens that by, by, through this process of genetic hitchhiking, this frequency of this blue allele, in this case, it's an allele that's associated with prostate cancer, it just decreased in frequency. And that's solely because it was closely linked to the selected allele. So the idea is whenever you think about selection, don't just think about what was the actual trait under selection, but think about what's in its genetic neighborhood. And so one thing when you think about our human genome is that, you know, roughly only 1% of it is coding. You know, there's the large, you know, much, much larger percentage of our genome is involved in, you know, gene is involved in regulatory function. And so one thing that my lab has done is we've looked to see, well, what sort of traits, what sort of tissues seem to have been the most under selection in the last 75,000 years? And so what Melanie did is she looked at, she created basically little tiny evolutionary trees at many, many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of sites in the human genome and identified branches where you happen to have really, really long branch lengths for one of these big continental groups. And one way to think about that is you have really big allele frequency differences. So maybe East Asia has a very high frequency and it's low in Europe and Africa. And one thing with Melanie's studies, we were able to figure out which tissues 
tend to be the fastest evolving over the last 75,000 years. So we looked at EGTLs that are affecting testes or looking at lung or liver. And what she found is tissues like testes, whole blood, sun exposed skin, skeletal muscle, liver, all of those tend to be really fast evolving, okay? Tissues that tend to be slow evolving often are brain related and some female related tissues. And we can sort of, we can force rank these by say which ones seem to be under the most local adaptation. The other neat thing that she found is that when we look at EQTLs or regulatory variants that affect many tissues, we find that the more tissues that are very affects, the less likely it is to be possibly selected. So it's this idea that pleiotropy can inhibit adaptation. And the idea is that, think about each one of these alleles as like something that's affecting many tissues. If you're changing lots of tissues, maybe it's less likely to be beneficial than if you're only making a small change. And so I, I, I want to end this first part of the talk by sort of, you know, posing a question for the future. And I feel like this is just, the question is where are we headed, right? So we can imagine that we've got this very cozy life. It might not be quite as cozy as what's going on in, in WALL-E. But the idea here is that we've got this sort of buffered environment. And now these mutations that used to be deleterious, well, now they're protected, right? So we've got things like, you know, you know, if you happen to have flat feet, you know, we're, we're, we're wearing shoes. You know, if you happen to have, you know, bad vision, well, we've got glasses. And so the idea is that now we might have this increase in the amount of genetic load we're seeing. But we, we don't have a time machine, right? We can't go to the future. But what we can do is we can look to the past. And one thing we can do is we can, this actually came out of um, a discussion in lab. We actually were just wondering like how healthy would a human Neanderthal hybrid be? Sort of an odd question, but we basically were, scratching our heads, we're like, well, we don't have any you know, physical samples, we can go back and figure that out. But what we can do is we can apply precision medicine or polygenic risk score approaches to ancient samples. And the nice thing about that is that you don't even need to have that much of a sample. All you need is a little bit of a DNA. And what that does is allows us to know how have disease risks evolved over time. So what Ali and Taylor did is they you know, scoured databases and cure, you know, ended up finding you know, roughly 140 genomes that had enough quality DNA that we can, we can do this analysis. We also looked through a number of ge uh, genome-wide association study data. We trimmed that to identify you know, unique disease-associated alleles. So we've got a data set of roughly 3,000 of these disease associations. Almost all the samples we're looking at are from Europe. Um, and most of them range from, you know, say, 2,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. But some of them can go really back in time. And so what we did was we then applied these precision medicine approaches to each ancient sample. So what we're doing is we're generating these polygenic risk scores. And this, on the bottom panel here, I'm showing what we call a pokey plot. And it's a way of sort of visualizing the risk factors in each person's genome. So at the first site, the individual's heterozygous. They've got one red allele, one blue. Second site, they're homozygous for the disease allele. Third site, we've got missing data, right? This is an ancient sample. And then the fourth site, they're homozygous for the risk allele. The little numbers inside correspond to beta values or effect sizes, so that fourth allele counts more than the second one. And so what we did is that we had to deal with this challenge of missing data. And what we did is we compared each genome to a set of modern genomes, and then we masked out the missing data. And what we did is we converted this raw polygenic risk score to a percentile. So we're basically saying, if that ancient individual lived today, what percentile risk would they be in modern humans? And we did this for every ancient sample we could get our hands on. When we did this, we actually found a number of interesting things. So the first thing is, whenever we look at a different sample age range, we find that the range of polygenic risk score percentiles, it's, it spans the full spectrum from very low risk to very high risk, okay? The other thing we find, though, is that as you go more closer and closer to the present, we find that the mean and median of these polygenic risk scores tends to get a bit better. So this suggests that what's happening is that our genomes, if it's weird to say our genomes are healthy, but in some sense our genomes are looking health, healthier and healthier as we get closer to the present. So maybe it just is that as human populations have expanded, natural selection has been able to weed out some of these disease alleles. You know, things are getting better, supposedly. Um, we can actually look at individual samples. So this is showing the a risk radar for Otzi the Tyrolean, Tyrolean ice, Iceman. Um, and we can see that, you know, our genetic prediction is that he would have had really, really bad cardiovascular health. His morphological health and, you know, muscular health would actually be pretty good. Not so good when it comes to immune disease. Um, it actually turns out that he had really, really bad arteries. So it actually matches up with the known phenotype of Otzi. Um, turns out that he didn't die of a heart attack. He died because somebody killed him. Um, times were very tough in the past. Um, but the neat thing with this is showing that, yeah, sometimes this can actually really inform, you know, how healthy ancient samples were. 
But we still have a number of open questions, right? And so it's not like this is a closed book. So one thing is that whenever we look at disease alleles, we, we can use ancient DNA to look at how strong has the selection been acting on these GWAS loci. And then also we want to say, well, which diseases have been under the most selection in recent history? And so Karina in my lab has tackled this problem. And the first thing that she had to deal with was the fact that not everybody who lived in the past is a direct ancestor of present day humans. So we had to correct for that, right? We had to say, if somebody's an ancient individual, it's an ancient European hunter-gatherer, chances are he or she didn't contribute as much to modern human genomes as say, um, an ancient um, farmer. We also then could use, what we've got now is a set of ancient data, and each one of these has, has a time estimate. And what we can do is we can use this time series data to infer, infer allele frequency trajectories. So this is showing, I think, nine of the most interesting ones to me. So they happen to be disease associated. They came from Neanderthal and they have trajectories that aren't completely flat. And the idea is that if your allele frequency over time is flat, that suggests that there's not much selection going on. But if it's going through big changes, that's indicative that maybe one of these two forms of this, elite, this at the SNP tends to be under selection. So what we're really doing is trying to identify low side like this green one, where it goes from a high frequency going to be a very low frequency over time. And when we do that, we can look at the set of over 3,000 loci. We can infer what the, this is looking at, it's a folded distribution of fitness effects. And what we're doing is we're saying, how strong has selection been acting on, this G, on these GWAS loci? And it turns out, that the vast majority of these are not under strong selection. So only 0.3% have a selection coefficient greater than 0.01. We have some of these that are in moderate selection, but it really is hinting, hinting that many of these disease loci, they're, they're not really being driven by financial selection. And, and that might make some sense a little bit too, where something has like a late onset, say prostate cancer, well that's you know post-reproductive age and it's only affecting one sex. Maybe it's not gonna affect how many kids you have that much or your chance of surviving to adulthood. The one major exception we had here involved um, a lot of hits in the MHC HLA region on chromosome 6, and then also SNPs that were associated with asthma and uh, a kidney disease that actually is an, is an immune disease. So the, the real hit that came out of here is that if it's immune-related GWAS hit, well, then it might actually be under some sorts of selection. So that gives a little bit of an idea about what's going over time, but we also want to think about what's going on in the present. And the one thing to be aware of is that there's a lot of health disparities out there. And if you had asked me 10 years ago, would I be studying prostate cancer? I probably would have been surprised, but that's because at the time I didn't realize that there are major, major differences in prostate cancer risk across the globe. So prostate cancer is a very polygenic disease. It's not Mendelian. There's a lot of genes that affect it. But the thing that's interesting about it is that there's a really high heritability, um, at least for a cancer. And so what this means is that there might be a genetic basis to the health disparity that exists for prostate cancer. And so not only thinking about like, well, what are the genetic variants that contribute to this, but also the evolution of biology to me is, is intriguing because what, what it means is that I'm wondering about, well, why do we see these differences for prostate cancer, but we don't see it necessarily for other cancers. Um, and so, so what's going on there? And so just to illustrate what the, the health disparity for prostate cancer, this is looking at data from the World Health Organization. It's looking at prostate cancer mortality. It's age standardized. And you can see that the risk of prostate cancer death at, really does vary throughout the, throughout the world. I mean, you can think, you know, any man lives to 110, well, he might get prostate cancer. But in some places of the world, you tend to have aggressive prostate cancer a little bit younger age. And the general trend that comes out of this is that the risk of prostate cancer are a bit higher in Sub-Saharan Africa and also in the Caribbean. We can look closer to homes, right? So we can, we can look in the Southeast United States and then we can look by county. We can say, well, what percentage of people happen to be African-American? We can look at and you can see it varies by county. And then we can see, does that happen to match the prostate cancer mortality rates? And it's amazing how much it's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence in terms of African-American percent prostate cancer mortality. Now you might say like, is this just access to care? And like, that's a great question, but it turns out when you look at another male cancer, you look at testicular cancer, you see that there's a very different pattern and it doesn't have this nice concordance with African-American percentage. It's actually interesting, if you look in Georgia, you look at Atlanta, we've got, you know, Atlanta's, you know, has a large percentage of African-American men. Prostate cancer mortality is actually not that high in Atlanta. And that's probably due to, to Piedmont, to Grady, to Emory Healthcare. Basically our hospitals are doing a good job of decreasing prostate cancer mortality in Atlanta. So it's not just a genetics thing. It's not just an ancestry, but there's also other aspects that play into this. So one thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to look at, well, how do predicted risk of prostate cancer vary throughout the world? 
So this is showing an admixture plot, and each color corresponds to a different ad, uh, ancestry component. It's over 3,000 individuals from you know over 60 different populations, and each population is force ranked in terms of does it have a greater predicted risk of prostate cancer to does it have a lower predicted risk of prostate cancer. And when we do this, we can see that there's something going on here where we notice that if you happen to have an orange or a maroon or brown, you know, ancestry, you tend to be much more likely to have prostate cancer than if you have this, you know, light blue, pink, or especially the gray ancestry. And you might be wondering, like, what are these populations? Well, it turns out that a lot of the populations of the highest predicted risk of prostate cancer, they're ones that are found in West Africa. The exceptions, if you look on the bottom of it, tends to be populations that are found in East Asia. So there's this gradient of prostate cancer risk as you look throughout the world. But th that gets at the, the sort of the, the phenomenon of there being differences in genetic risk, but it doesn't really get at the why. And so there's a lot going on in this plot, but um, I'll walk you through it. And so the thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to say, Okay, if we take the set of known prostate cancer associated loci and say, do they look like they're under selection? So we use Bergen Coop's polygenic test of adaptation, and it turns out that this set of prostate cancer loci, they're not really under that much selection as a whole. That makes sense, this is late onset disease, but that doesn't mean that individual loci are not themselves under selection. Okay, so each, to each row here is a different prostate cancer associated SNP. The different colors correspond to different continental groups. The solid circles are the actual cancer-associated SNPs, and the open circles are the basically the top hit in terms of selection score in the neighborhood of that SNP. And the x-axis is just measuring how much of a signal there is for selection. So on the far right, those are regions of the genome that look like they're under a lot of selection. And it turns out that almost all of these prostate cancer SNPs have pretty low CMS scores. There's a couple ones that have moderate scores, but they happen to be in regions that have even higher scores. So this suggests that maybe genetic hitchhiking might be causing some of these alleles to increase in frequency. So what we did is we looked at um, sort of my favorite hit from this paper, and we looked at this SNP, so it's RS758-4330, and the G allele, labeled in blue here, happens to be the allele that increases the risk of prostate cancer. The A allele is the one that decreases risk. And you can see there's this large allele frequency difference between populations. Well, it turns out that it looks like there was a selective sweep of over 100,000 base pairs, a partial selective sweep, that, that in Europe, where basically this, this increase in frequency of this protected allele. And if you look at what genes are in there, you have PRL, PRLH, which is involved in hormones, which probably is the causative gene for this trait. But there's another big gene in there that you know, has nothing to do with prostate cancer per se, but it actually might have been the target of the selective sweep. And it's a gene called melanophyllin. And, and the question is, well, what does it do? Well, melanophyllin leads to dilute pigmentation. So in humans, you can think about dilute sort of gray, grayish or sort of diluted uh, hair color. Um, in dogs, it makes them, doesn't make them look cute necessarily, but makes them look a little bit grayer. And so the idea here is that there might have been selection for dilute pigmentation in Europe, and they just happen to drag along an allele that has a protective role with respect to prostate cancer. So this is one sort of evolutionary cause of something that could contribute to this known health disparity. Um, but one problem with the study that I was talking about before is just that we weren't looking at prostate cancer cases and controls. We're looking at healthy individuals across the board. And to really get at the genetics of disease, we need to look at individuals that are both healthy and individuals that have a disease. So I'm pleased to be you know, a member of the, the MADCAP network. So MADCAP stands for Men of African Descent and Carcinoma of the Prostate. And it's this fantastic team that unites clinicians, bioinformaticians, and epidemiologists together from all over the world. Okay, we've got a huge number of study sites in Africa, a place in the United States, and then one study site over in the UK. And um, my role, I wear many hats in the MADCAP network, but one thing I do is I happen to be chair of the MADCAP genomics working group. Okay, so I basically coordinate all the genomics work that we're doing. And this consortium, okay, so you can think, imagine like, you know, it's sort of like we were, let's just say we were using Zoom before it was cool, so bi-weekly meetings across the, across the ocean, keeping in touch, but the, we've got two major goals here. And the first is that we're trying to build research capacity in Africa. The second is what we're trying to do is discover novel prostate cancer associated loci. So the idea is that the risks are higher in Africa, maybe we're missing some of those risks because too many of our studies have been done in European Americans or Europeans. We need to go to the continent to actually find out what's going on. What makes this particular network really unique 
is that we're conducting the first major GWAS where samples are genotyped in Africa. So most of the time in GWAS it's just genotyped here, but in this case, actually the samples are being sent to Cape Town and the actual, you know, you know, that stage of it is actually being done on the continent. One nice thing with this is we're funded from the National Cancer Institute, so it's this big U01 grant. It's amazing how fast the money can go when you have all these different study sites. But the one thing with this is that despite NCI funding us, we don't have enough money to do whole genome sequencing of all of our samples. So our GWAS is involving like 6,000 samples, 3,000 cases, 3,000 controls. That's a lot of individuals to do whole genome sequencing. So we knew early on that we would have to develop or use a, a genotyping array to look at specific spots in the human genome. It's a cheaper technology. It turns out that the existing technologies that are out there aren't that great for the task. There's the H3 Africa array. It's great for Africa, not that great for studying cancer. There's the Onco array. It's great for studying cancer, not that great for African populations. So what my lab did was we, we worked to build a new, new array that sort of combines the strengths of the H3 Africa array and the strengths of the Onco array. And it's with this major goal of being able to identify cancer-associated variants in Africa. So I'm going to walk you through a recent paper that we had in the lab and in, in terms of what we were able to discover with the array and how we built it. So the idea here with this array is instead of looking at 3 billion sites in the human genome, we're looking at 1 million polymorphic markers. And so the question is, well, what do we want to include here? So if we're going to only look at 1.5 million spots only, 1.5 million spots in the human genome, what are the ones that we care most about? Well, we had a number of inclusion criteria. Some of that include any, included any region that was known to be associated with cancer. We wanted to saturate that and have as many variances that we, as we could. We also wanted a GWAS background. We didn't want to just focus on the cancer loci. We wanted to look across the entire human genome. But based on Melanie's work, we knew that EQTLs are very important. And so what we knew is there's some, there's you know, 60,000 or so prostate EQTLs. We basically wanted any site that was known to affect gene expression in the prostate or could possibly affect gene expression in the prostate. We wanted that on our array too. Also another thing that the major challenge in bioinformatics is to integrate data from different studies. So we also wanted overlap with other markers. There were a few other inclusion criteria. So we have other phenotype data like BMI, male pattern baldness, other traits. And so any SNPs that were associated with any of these other traits, we wanted to saturate array for that. And so what we ended up doing was generating a new technology that is optimized for detecting prostate cancer associations in African populations. So did it work? The good thing is it did. So, so the thing is, is that, you know, basically we're, we're calling 99% of these SNPs and, and we're able to do that. Um, and, and, and the way that we were able to test how well it worked is we have this pilot data set of the first 802 samples to be genotyped. Right now we're playing with a, a sample, study, uh, sample size of roughly 2,500. And over the next few months, we'll have the full 6,000 samples. And so our, our prostate cancer cases controls come from many places in Africa, but there's these seven primary study sites. And they're labeled here in terms of gold, in terms of Senegal. So we've got Hagi in Senegal, in Dakar, Senegal. And we've got two study sites in Accra, Ghana, so 37 military hospital in Korle Blue teaching hospital. In Nigeria, we have two study sites. One is University College Hospital in Ibadan, and then the other is University of Abuja teaching hospital. And then in blue, we have these two South African sites. We have VITS in, in light blue, and that happens to be in Johannesburg. It's actually the biggest hospital in the continent. And then we have a, a study site at Stellenbosch University in, Cape, in the Cape Town area. And what we could do is with these 802 samples is we could represent them in MDS space or PCA space and to basically see how are they related. And one thing that came out of this is we realized that instead of having two clusters, West Africa versus South Africa, our data actually clustered in three different ways. So the gold dots here actually correspond to samples from Senegal, that's one cluster. The green are from Ghana and Nigeria, and the blue are from South Africa. And it turns out that if you take your results from a PCA or MDS plot and you rotate it, I think it's 87 degrees, what you get is, is basically this story, which matches some of John November's work, this idea that genes can mirror geography. So this idea, this sort of diffusion of humans over space and time, it sort of, it reflects it, that if you happen to have your ancestors from a geographically close location, you might happen to have more similar genetics. We can also look at, you know, patterns of evolutionary history. So one thing that Melanie did was she used the data from the MADCAP array to look for signals of natural selection at cancer-associated loci. She found a number of hits, and this is just showing a Manhattan plot of her PBS scan for South African results. And I want to zoom in on one locus that, it, that just made the cutoff, so it's above the dashed line, it's on the X chromosome. And this is showing the allele frequencies of the risk-increasing allele 
all across our seven study sites. So blue here is the risk increasing allele. So it's RS691432, and you're like, what the heck is that? Well, it turns out that that's a prostate cancer-associated variant that's X-linked, and the closest gene to that is the androgen receptor. So we're not sure exactly why that happened to have this, this moderately large difference in allele frequencies between po populations in Africa, but it's a known cancer-associated variant. And it also suggests that whenever we're looking at the African continent, you have to be really careful to, to use a one-size-fits-all approach, right? Because the allele frequencies that we're dealing with, they can vary a decent bit. And one reason for that is that there's such a long history of humans living in Africa that there's been plenty of time for allele frequencies to, to diverge, whether that's through drift or through selection. We can also apply our MADCAP pilot data to look at predicted risk of prostate cancer in Europeans and Africans. So what Michelle did here was she looked at polygenic risk scores and the y-axis here just showing the probability density or how often we happen to see a particular polygenic risk score. And she compared our seven study sites, gold, green, and blue, to populations from the 1000 Genomes Project, to European individuals, and those are represented in gray. And the important thing is when she did this, she used the, the best polygenic risk score for prostate cancer that's out there to date. And the problem with that PRS is that it uses European American data. So it's basically, it's ascertained in one small part of the world. And when, when, when she did this, what she found is that the predicted risk of prostate cancer was shifted really far to the right when we're dealing with African populations. I mean, that's consistent with what we know about prostate cancer mortality, but that's a pretty large shift. And so the question is, is that real? Or how much of that's due to this bias or where did this polygenic risk score come, comes from? And so for the final fourth of my talk, what I'm going to address is this issue of these challenges of we're taking genetic predictions from one part of the world, largely from European Americans, to other parts of the world. And there's two motivating questions here. One is, how well do these polygenic risk scores generalize across the world? And second, how can we improve that? You know, right? So it's one thing to say, oh yeah, they don't generalize well, but are there ways that we can improve this? So we had a paper a couple of years ago in, in genome biology, and what we did is we looked at a large, large number of genome-wide associated loci. Okay, so we're looking at disease-associated SNPs, and the null expectation here is that the allele frequencies of these SNPs should be this, the risk SNP should be the same wherever you look. There's no a priori reason to expect that disease risks are going to be that different across the globe. And so we expected these four different continental, subcontinental groups to have the dots all about the same point. When we did this, we actually saw some big differences, okay? Especially for metabolic diseases. Um, and the idea here, so for GI or liver, yeah, pretty similar. But for metabolic diseases, we found that the risk allele frequencies were way higher in Africa. Cardiovascular diseases actually way lower, and it's like that doesn't fit with what we know about car cardiovascular disease risk in the US. And so this idea that, wow, the set of loci that we have, it's biased, and it might actually lead to some misprediction of genetic risk. We could also look at individual SNPs, and since I'm an evolutionary geneticist, one thing that I was curious about was, well, what happens if we look at whether alleles are ancestral or derived? And so we're looking at whether the risk-increasing allele happens to be ancestral, and this means shared with chimpanzees, so these are the red dots, or if it happens to be due to a new mutation in human lineages, in the human lineage. And so that, those are blue dots. And the expectation here is that there should be no pattern in terms of ancestral or derived being above or below the line. So we're comparing African to non-African allele frequencies. But what we found is that the set of known disease-associated loci, we found that ancestral risk alleles, whenever you have an ancestral risk allele, tends to be higher frequency in Africa than outside of Africa. The opposite is true whenever there's something going on, whenever it's a derived risk allele. And so we kept scratching our head thinking about, well, what could be causing it? What could be causing this bias, bias in these mean, mean risk allele frequencies? What could be causing this bias in terms of this evolutionary difference? And ultimately, there's three main causes for this. At first, we thought it'd be this nice, simple answer, and the truth is that none, no single cause can explain the pattern. So first of all, it's where, where have the studies been done? So most studies use these bottleneck European samples. And so what we know about disease is not reflecting the rest of the world. The other problem is that a lot of, especially initial studies, they were relatively underpowered. And when you have a small study, you only have statistical power to detect common risk alleles. So we're missing a lot of the rare ones. And then finally, almost every GWAS that's been done to date uses an array that's been hindered, a genotyping array that's been hindered by the SNP ascertainment bias. It's basically, you're enriching four SNPs that are you know, moderate frequency in Europe. You're sort of ignoring the African variation. 
And so this, what I think of as a zipper plot is a way to show this, this, these different forms of bias. So what Michelle generated here is a huge number of computer of simulated GWAS. The bias is on the Y axis. So if there's no bias at all, it's on that dashed line. And then the X axis shows the sample size in terms of number of cases controls. Um, the light shading indicates what happens if you use a genotyping array, and the dark shading indicates what happens if you use whole genome sequences. And so the general trend is if you have small sample size, you're going to have very biased results in terms of your disease association. It gets a little bit better when you get big sample sizes, but it never quite goes away, and you're better off using whole genome sequencing than arrays. You have the potential to do that. And so what are the implications of this bias? Well, what it can do is it can lead to these massive shifts in terms of hereditary disease risks. Okay, so once again, the no expectation for saying more metabolic diseases is that each of these continental regions should have the same sort of distribution. But what we imply, what we apply results from the, um, the, the GWAS catalog, what we see is that predicted risk of metabolic diseases like type 2 di diabetes, those are elevated for individuals of African descent. Okay, and so something's going on, and it's basically the problem is that we, because we only have a biased set of known loci right now. So one thing that we did, we were able to sort of fold these three forms of bias together, and we were able to perform some corrections. And what we did is we took into account whether the risk allele was ancestral or derived. So we use this information from a couple slides back. And when we did that, it actually shifts this African distribution to the left. And in some cases, it actually is able to improve things. It's able to erase a lot of this bias. For some diseases, it doesn't. Okay, but it's important to know that knowing some evolutionary information can actually improve your ability to generalize results across populations. One thing you might also be wondering about is, well, how effective are these polygenic risk scores in general? Okay, so this is stuff that we're preparing this manuscript where we're looking at the larger sample MADCAP samples, so 2,500 samples, and this is a rock curve. So if you're familiar with this, the way that you measure how effective a polygenic risk score is, is you're looking at the area under the curve. And if it's on the diagonal line, it means it basically tells you nothing, okay? If the curve goes way to the upper left, that means it's really informative. And truth is that polygenic risk scores, they're only moderately effective. So what we did is, we, is, is, is what Michelle did is she took this polygenic risk, risk score that was generated from European Americans, and what she did is she applied it to people from the United Kingdom of European descent. She also applied it to African individuals from our MADCAP data set. And it turns out that the prediction is much, much better when you're using this European-based polygenic risk score if you're applying it to European samples. It does slightly better than chance when you apply it to African samples. So the idea here is that if you're trying to predict results across the world, you better have ancestry-matched GWAS to start with. And so there's this real challenge of, yeah, how do you take results from, say, China and say, well, I'm going to generalize that to India or to Africa? It, it's non-trivial to do that well. Um, another thing that we found in, with our results is actually that there tends to be a little bit of asymmetry here. So if you do a study in Africa, it actually generalizes a bit better to Europe than the converse. Um, so one way you can think about it is sort of like universal donors versus universal you know, recipients. So sort of like blood donating. In, in some sense, you're better off doing a study in Africa because that will generalize better to the rest of the world. Finally, the last data slide that I want to share is some stuff that we're sort of hot off the presses, we're working on this right now. And what we're doing is we're looking at a large number of anthropomorphic traits. We're looking at a couple thousand African individuals. And in this case, what Michelle's doing is she's trying to see how well we can predict the height of people in Africa using polygenic risk score. And so the truth is you look at this scatter plots, you're like, oh, not that well. And that's, that's the take home message for this slide. And so she looked at two different polygenic risk scores, one of which was using this threshold method, another one, the Lilo et al. one used machine learning. And you can see that the correlation is really weak. So the predicted height in Africa versus actual height, it's barely better than chance. It's actually a little bit worse too, because it turns out that rainforest hunter gatherers, in this case, it's the purple dots in the Congo basin, they're actually really short but the predicted height of them actually is above the mean. So it's, it's actually miscapturing that. And this is hinting that there are African specific alleles that are involved in height that we're missing if we're only using a European predictor. It actually turns out that when you look at genetic ancestry, so we can look at each one of these samples and we can look at the proportions of ancestry from different parts of Africa, we can actually predict height a bit better if we knew that somebody was 70% you know, San, 20% Bantu, and 10% Afroasiatic that actually would tell us a lot more about that individual's height than the polygenic risk score that was coming from Europeans. So just to recap, um, I'd like to mention that evolutionary history really does help inform our understanding of disease risk. 
The other thing is when we look across, if we look using ancient samples, one thing we find is that most genome-wide association GWAS loci, most of those are not, are, are not under strong selection. So few of these are under selection. Also the idea that genetic differences between populations, well, that can actually contribute to health disparities. It's not simply an access to care issue. And then finally, there's this real need that if you really want to be able to predict disease risk, you need to do studies in diverse global populations. You can't just restrict them to one small part of the world. And so with that, I'd like to thank the many people who passed through my lab. There actually wasn't room enough on this slide to put everybody's name. Also a large number of collaborators here. And thank you for listening. So thanks very much. Yeah, so I hit unmute all, so I think everybody should be able to talk if they want, yeah. Okay, so now is a good opportunity um, for people to uh, unmute um, and ask Joe some questions if you have questions about what he just presented. And chat works as well, too. Yeah. Yes, there's, there are lots of encouraging things coming through the chat, but I don't <laughs> see I don't see questions yet. So, so Joe, that was a, an awesome talk. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me start at the beginning of your talk about the male bias um, mm -hmm. in the out-of-Africa migration. Can you give us a sort of a um, conceptual version of that? Because I guess it's the bias in the DNA that's gone into future generations, not necessarily the bias in actual sex ratios of people migrating. Yeah, yeah. So what we're looking at is we're looking at measures of X-linked diversity to autosomal. And the way that you measure it is you basically are looking at what proportion of the sites are you heterozygous for. So you're measuring genetic diversity. And we know is that when humans left Africa, we're getting this gradual reduction in diversity. But the idea is that if you have fewer women migrating or moving out of Africa, what ends up happening is that because each male is, is you want to think about what's the effective number of X chromosomes that make it out of Africa versus the effective number of autosomes. And you'd expect to see a little bit of a difference because there's just differences in, because it's basically a three to four ratio, but it turns out that the drop off is even faster than you would expect by chance. It turns out that if you were to fast forward 200, 300, 400,000 years in the future, eventually your diversity is gonna be the same across the globe, but we haven't had enough time to recover that diversity. And so the way that we did this was we basically are saying, what's the effective number of X chromosomes versus the effective number of autosomes that made it out? And we have a little bit different answers if you look at South Asia versus Europe, and that's one reason why we've got this range of like 60 to 70%. Um, I, I tend to like the X versus autosome a little bit more in the Y and the mitochondria because you've got recombination, you've got a lot more data there. And so if you try to do the same thing using Y versus mitochondria, you'll get a point estimate, but your confidence intervals are going to be really, really bad, actually. Hey, Joe, this is King. Great talk. I just want to second that. Really enjoyed it. I have a question about um, the strength of selection on those mm -hmm. loci that are associated with different diseases. So it was very interesting that you didn't find um, much there. So, and you talked about how many of these diseases might be post-reproductive. But I was wondering about the effect size of these variants. Is there a relationship between the effect size and the strength of selection? Presumably lots of the variants that are associated with disease for complex common disease have you know, relatively low effect sizes in contrast to those that, you know, are causative for monogenic diseases, for yeah. example. So do you uh, see a relationship there? Yeah, so that's a great question. So what we did is we actually, we did look at that and it's tricky because we're comparing effect sizes for different diseases, right? So it's a little bit apples to oranges. For most diseases, we don't see any sort of relationship. The one exception is that um, what Corrine did is she subdivided and said, well, what if I only look at stuff that's in the MHC or like, you know, involved in immune function? And when we did that, you actually see a relationship. So in general, the like, it, it, there's this decoupling of how much does it increase your risk of a particular disease with what that S is, what that selection coefficient is. But when it comes to immune diseases, immune traits, then you start to see a little bit more coupling there. Uh, we have time for about, we have time for one more. Joe, let me let me ask you a question. Yeah. You and I have talked about this a, a couple of times, but I, I think it's potentially still interesting. Um, what are the chances that you can uh, identify patterns of epistasis in data sets like this? And yeah, and and what are the implications of either being able to do that or not? <laughs> 
Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I come from sort of an epistasis world. I'm very pro epistasis. The problem is, is that sample size will kill you a lot of times because you've got to have combinations of alleles that it's, they each individually might be rare, but that combination is very rare. When it comes to disease associated loci, like for prostate cancer, for any disease, you're better off saying doing sort of your single SNP or single gene level analysis. And then you have your hits and then you start to look for pairwise interaction. Because what it does is it basically it minimizes the sort of multiple testing penalty you get. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, genetic background does matter. I think it, it, it is tricky in terms of figuring out what are the effects of those of that context. I mean, I think, you know, where it's really interesting is when you think about sort of like the introgressed alleles and you can have alleles that were good in a Neanderthal background. Now they're in this human genetic background. And so we know that we, we, we don't have, <clears throat> we know that selection is weeded out a lot in Neanderthal DNA. And one thing I'm really interested in is this question of, is it just because the Neanderthal DNA just contains a lot of bad alleles or maybe, or is it due to this epistatic interactions? Is it due to the fact that it just doesn't play well with the rest of the, the human genome? Um, and we're trying to attack that in different ways, but it's actually, the big thing is that sample size is the major challenge. So you need big data sets to really look at this. Other questions? Um, I have a question. This is a Hide. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, great talk. Great talk, Joe. Um, so my quick question was, did you did you um, maybe glean any insight between uh, what differences in selection pressure might be between males who currently live in Africa versus African American males who are probably three to four hundred years on average removed? from their African yeah. ancestors, say for yeah. something like prostate cancer uh, alleles. Yeah, so we haven't explicitly done that. I think there's there's been at least a couple studies that have looked at how much selection has gone on in the last three or 400 years, and there hasn't been that much. It's, it, in terms of evolutionary time, it's a pretty short time interval. The, the way to attack that problem would be to look at, to contrast different sorts of statistics. So a lot of what we're doing with this PBS statistics, we're looking at stuff that detects selection that's in deep time, you know, say 50,000 years or so. There's other haplotype based things that are looking at that, that actually have a much better shorter time window and those might help a little bit, but it still is tricky because it's, it's almost like there just haven't been that many generations. So like even if something was to increase in frequency from one to 2% in the last 300 years, that's such a subtle change that it's hard for things to be pulled out. Um, but we but, haven't explicitly. But, 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 but if, if these were of large effect, do you think that that might have something to do with Maybe the differences you see? It, it could, but I, I think I would probably think what, what might be a bigger issue are genotype by environment effects. So you can imagine that the environment of what Af of, of what any given African American is living with might be very different than somebody living in Accra, Ghana. And I think like those sort of effects might be playing a bigger role. So you might have an allele that's found in African American genomes and found in, Af in sub-Saharan Africa as well, but the environment con the environmental context is different. And I think that actually might play a little bit bigger role. Um, but, but once again, it's something, it's an open question. Um, we, we really don't know the answer yet. Okay, so I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank everyone again for joining us today and participating. Uh, I'll echo the comments in the chat. That was a really good seminar, lots of fun. Uh, there are great comments in there in the chat for you, Joe. Uh, and with this, um, say bye to everyone uh, and see you next time. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Thanks.